I am so grateful for the opportunity to come uh, and speak to you all at Cornell. You all are regularly in my prayers. Um, I've been coming to Cornell and speaking for maybe 12-ish sort of years. And the evolution I've seen of the group from a group that mostly is concerned about organizing for itself, caring for its own membership, and now becoming a group that actually cares more and more about um, what does it mean to be a Christian? Asian American presence on campus is profound. And I love being here. Um, otherwise, uh, for those of you who like these kind of things, um, I'm from the Chicago area, University of Chicago undergraduate, Northwestern for Law School. I currently live in Manhattan. Uh, my wife is an assistant professor of internal medicine at Mount Sinai um, School of Medicine, where she does research on HIV AIDS, uh, mother child transmission issues. Uh, for people who like personal details, I have two daughters. Uh, who are weird and delightful. My youngest one's name is Kirsten. Um, what's worth saying about Kirsten at this point? Uh, Kirsten just finished her second reread of Harry Potter. Um, and so um, she could be anyone at Harry Potter trivia at age seven. And she's done it twice now. She just finished it. She read it once um, before, and I said, well, let's read it again, see if you learn anything new. So she just started up again, and I think finished all eight books in like four months. Or seven books. So that's kind of the younger one. The older one's name is Madeline. She's ever so slightly obsessed with um, World War II, the Holocaust, and Nazi Germany. And so she just, uh, she's in the middle of reading the diary of Anne Frank and um, the boy in the striped pajamas, which are both kind of Holocaust uh, recountings, and that's kind of her thing. Um, her, 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 her current request for family vacation is can we go to Washington, D.C. so we can go to the Holocaust Museum one more time? So those are the daughters I'm raising, <laughs> and they're fascinating, um, and they're, they're odd, uh, and like, they're also a little obsessed with musicals, if any of you are musical fans, so um, whether it's Hamilton, Les Miserables, uh, My Fair Lady, The King and I, you can throw out lines and they'll start, they'll shoot a line back or try to weave in lines from the musicals into everyday conversation, that's their idea of a game. Um, they're new <coughs> children, they may end up here someday. Um, let me pray for us as we head off into this question of identity in Asian America. Um, <coughs> Father, I'm convinced um, we are here for a purpose, that nobody's here by accident, even if some of us are wondering right now why we are here and why we aren't back in our dorms or somewhere on campus doing something else. Um, I'm convinced you've made no mistakes and that fundamental um, to my understanding of the universe is that you are a God who never makes mistakes. And so, um, Thank you for bringing us here. Keep us attentive to your word and your person um, and focused on your purpose as we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. I realized uh, Stephen actually talked about what it meant to be Asian American at the first large group meeting of the year, but I, I wonder if some of you are thinking, you know, it is a little strange, right? Um, why are we meeting as an Asian American community? It's not as if we don't fit in at Cornell. There are a lot of Asian Americans here. Does anybody know how many Asian American students there are at Cornell? Okay, a lot is not easy to answer. <laughs> 4,000. 4,000 Asian American students at Cornell. And why do they self-identify? Well, let's play a little game for a second. Um, we're going to call this game Stand Up. So if I say something that applies to you, stand up. So um, you are um, a male. Stand up. Okay, great. Just, just practice. Go ahead and sit down. Um, how many of you um, play a musical instrument? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, you don't have to be embarrassed. Okay, okay great. Sit down. Um, how many of you, when you're at um, like a fast food restaurant and you see the napkin bin, you <laughs> dig your fingers <laughs> <laughs> Have those plastic bags. Pull them in a square time. There are a whole bunch of parents who are crying right now, like, I, what went wrong? <laughs> How many of you are a child of immigrants? A child of immigrants. Okay. Um, go ahead, sit down. <laughs> so people like, oh. Yeah, now how many of your children of your parents are immigrants? <laughs> <laughs> how many of you have parents who 
immigrated to the United States. <laughs> okay, go ahead, sit down. Um, how many of you speak mostly a language other than English, or at least understand it when it's spoken to you mostly? <laughs> There are reasons we, so many of us were standing, right? And at one level, I don't want to reduce being Asian American to a series of cruel stereotypes, but the reality is they're reasonably true for us as a community, right? In part because those stereotypes represent issues related to our immigration histories, right? Of um, parents and um, grandparents who probably, if they came from Asia, as most of ours did, uh, were poor and therefore saving uh, garbage bags for reuse was actually not just an issue of ecological appropriateness, but actual financial necessity. For whom free napkins, <laughs> which you would take not just from the restaurant, but then would stash in your car, yes. was an act of thriftiness because you were saving money because you might be sending it back home to um, your countries of origin. You were saving it because your children were going to be expensive and cost a lot of money later in life. <laughs> <laughs> you were trained in music because um, for most of our parents, the <coughs> hey Steven, can you do me a favor? I have a glass of water back. <coughs> I wasn't projecting correctly. Um, most of us play musical instruments because for our parents, the idea was um, our children should have every advantage to prepare them for the world. Right? And that included being reasonably well-rounded. And I think reasonably was, how many of you played at, were um, involved in sports or athletics in high school? See, that's a generational change. It wasn't well, true for my generation, but um, I think this gener your generation of parents were like, to get into good schools, they must not just be academically oriented, right? But <laughs> all of that reflects a little bit of our culture. And if you were here at our first large group meeting, um, Stephen, the staff worker at uh, <clears throat> Asian American University, talked a little bit about how do we begin to analyze culture. And so I'm going to go through it quickly and then move us further um, in this conversation. So part of what he said is, right, Christians believe that God created everything and he created it well and he created it beautifully. And therefore, every part um, that our cultures all reflect some fundamental aspects of goodness that reflect the goodness of God. So I would argue for most Asian uh, American cultures, um, whether East Asian, South Asian, Southeast Asia, etc., is one of the things that we tend to do well is that we do community reasonably well, right? Because we think as members of a community, not just as individuals. So for most of us, um, how many of you know your Asian name? Like if you have a non-English name, right? <clears throat> What's the first character? Family name. Okay, someone used that last name, and if you think about it, it's not your last name, it's the first character. Right? <laughs> what is it? Um, it's your family name, right? In, in our Asian cultures, the way we identify ourselves, the first thing you say about yourself is what family you belong to. Right, if you're in at least a Chinese culture, like I, I'm, I'm Chinese, uh, the second character is often a generational marker, right? All the men of my generation share the same character. Some of our families go through poems, and so you can go like, we're the 28th generation of this family, because they're literally choosing the next character in the poem each time. In many Asian cultures, the last thing that you find out about somebody when they introduce themselves is who they are as an individual, right? It starts with family, with generation, and then with the individual. Contrast that with the West, right? Where in the West, the first thing you learn about me is who I am as an individual, and the last thing that you learn about me is my last name. Right? There's a, an orientation difference. And I think Asian community, one of the God-given gifts is that we do that. Right? It's a little bit of how Mulan is different than all the other Disney princesses. Right? So how many of you grew up watching or remember Disney princesses from the various movies and stuff, right? So my, my younger daughters, well, my daughters, um, well, we were too cheap to actually buy the movies, so we just watched clips on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else's family do that? Okay, just a few. So um, to give you a sense of my youngest daughter, Kirsten, her idea, of her favorite clips were like, um, any of you watch Tangled? Yes. Yeah. Her favorite clip was, Papa, can I see Mother Gothel Hall? 
And she loved that Flynn Rider's climbing up and then gets and then the stabbing and he falls to right. That's her favorite scene there. And then Frozen, <laughs> her favorite scene was Baba. I want to see Parrot die song again. This is two, three, and four, right? Um, was it, do you want to build a snowman? Right? Do you want to build a? Why are they putting the cloth over the parent's face, Papa? I'm dead. Oh. I want to see song again, Papa. So, but if you notice with almost every Disney movie, right, in, that's with a blonde or redhead or brown haired princess, the goal is I want so much more than this provincial life, right? The goal is to escape your family, escape your like the humdrum life that you have into adventure. Which is the classic Western story, right? You leave your family behind and you go on your own quest. The only contrast to that is Mulan, right? Because Mulan isn't leaving home to find her identity, she's leaving home to lose her identity. Why? Is she leaving because she's bored with her home? Is she leaving because she can't handle this humdrum, um, poor provincial life? No, she's doing it for a really Asian reason, right? Mulan's leaving home and hiding her identity to sacrifice herself for her father. Which is why I show that movie a lot to my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> Americans, part of our task as Asian American University is to identify what are those creationally good things that we can affirm, right? Part of the story of scripture, part of, of what it means to be a Christian is that we actually believe sin has entered the world, that there are broken pieces in every culture because we're all um, selfish and um, grasping. And so every culture gets critiqued um, by the Christian scriptures. For Asian Americans, this is quick because I have another thing entirely to do, is um, I think the way that men and women relate in most Asian cultures is something that breaks God's heart. Um, if you look at Genesis, the goal was to create men and women in partnership together of equal value, status, authority, and responsibility. And far too often in Asian cultures, what you'll find is um, that men dominate, uh, women are just designed to serve, right? So typical thing, men talk, women are peeling fruit. Right? Men eat, women are serving tea. Um, and I think that is actually less than what God intends for both men and women, that actually it's partnership that he intends, right? There are broken aspects of our culture. In our wider culture, that's super obvious, right? Rather than stewarding the creation that he's given us, we actually exploit it uh, and destroy it as we go. Part of what we believe is that Jesus has come to change that. That actually because Jesus has arrived in the world, we have the ability to bring both the great things in our culture, the broken things in our culture to the cross and say, actually, Lord, I want you to transform this and help me use this in ways that honor you, that actually cause human flourishing and allow people to flourish. And part of what draws us together as a fellowship here are those two things. We actually think Asian American culture needs to be redeemed um, and renewed and then used as a set of gifts. And we believe that God has something to say about it. And that's what brings us together as an Asian American university. We want to bring those two things together. And so what I want to talk a little bit about tonight is how do those two things fit? And I think a lot about how things fit, as well as the question, like, why am I here? And what am I doing? Right? And I don't know if any of you ask that at Cornell. Like, what am I doing here? Freshmen particularly, right? And you might be like, why? Why did I say yes to this? <laughs> um, for those of you who are seniors, you really may be asked, like, why? Why did I say yes to this? I think about that a lot in terms of mission and Christian fellowship because my own experiences of Christian fellowship at the University of Chicago were really good and life-changing, but my experiences of leadership were quite poor. So um, to give you a sense of what the fellowship thought of me my junior year, well, actually at the end of my sophomore year, the nominating committee for leaders came to visit me in my dorm room because I had applied to be a leader, and I thought, you know, I'd be a Bible student or something. And they came one Saturday and said, hey, Greg, we want to talk to you. Um, we'd like you to consider being president of the chapter next year. And it was a mixed chapter of grad and undergraduate students, so there were some people who were 10 years older than me um, in the fellowship. And, and I knew they had to ask me to be on the leadership team, because frankly, we weren't a very big fellowship and they were going to run out of people, right? But uh, I didn't think they'd ask me to be president. And so I was about to go, okay, sure, I'll do it. They said, well, wait, at least pray about it. And what I wanted to say is, you're kind of stuck if I say no, because what they told me was, Greg, you need to know, as we invite you to be president, you weren't our first choice or even our second choice. Those people have already said no. <laughs> we like, but so we're down to you. And I was like, if I say no, you guys are screwed. You better, you better, you should just tell me to say yes now, right? So with that kind of um, amazing encouragement and blessing, <laughs> I became mean, president of the chapter. Um, I do wonder, though, for you all, have you thought, 
you, why are you here? Not here in this room right now. I mean, most, many of you said that you're just dutiful Asians, and so they said, we're doing this program, and so you said you would come. That's often how we work. And then your friends were going, so you felt like you should. Some of you may not be sure why you're here, and you're like, the longer you talk, the less sure I become, Greg. Right? So we'll try to make sure. I believe God has created Asian American University to leverage uh, its ethnic identity, the opportunities and experiences that you have, and um, the potential that God has given you to accomplish something far bigger than yourselves. I'm convinced that God desires to use your ethnic identity and background, the experiences that you've been entrusted with, and your temperament and passions to do something greater than yourselves. Now, Cornell will tell you this at your opening convocation, right, freshmen? Right, the first, if you, I'm sure there was some greeting by the president where they're like, you're the most accomplished and <laughs> best scoring class in the world. Your scores are better than those seniors. We don't even know why we let them in. <laughs> wow. right, we're getting better and better every year. Right? You hear that all the time, and the Alumni Association will tell you, you have a great future ahead of you. But what strikes me about all of those visions for you is it's largely about your achievement and what you can accomplish. And I want to suggest that God has invited you something bigger. And he's going to use all of who you are about, uh, including your ethnic identity. So if you have a Bible, turn with me to Exodus chapter 2. If you don't have a Bible, thankfully there's one right in front of you in the queue. You can open that. Exodus is the second chapter, second book of the Old Testament. And if you're familiar with the story, um, Moses has been born is basically where it starts. But if you're not familiar with the story of Exodus, um, the, the Jews, they weren't Israelites yet, um, had, been, had left um, Palestine and moved into Egypt 400 years before as a way to escape famine. During that 400 year period, they moved from being um, free shepherds to slaves to the Egyptians. They're oppressed quite, quite cruelly. Um, at one point, there's so many of them, um, the Pharaoh decides to commit genocide and just basically says, kill all the firstborn boys. And um, chapter 1 of Exodus tells you why Moses does not die. And if you know the rest of the story of Exodus, it's about how Moses <clears throat> comes in because God has called him to to challenge the Pharaoh to actually, um, through God's work via Moses, manages to rescue the people of Israel, hundreds of thousands of them, and leads them um, into the desert uh, to meet God at Sinai, and then from there up back into Palestine. In chapter 2, you have Moses' um, childhood and early life. And I want to suggest that his entire trajectory is set by this. Um, and you begin to see how God sets him up to accomplish his designs and his purposes. So, chapter 2 of Exodus, what I want you to notice in the first 10 verses is this. Look at how the things that were completely not in Moses' control actually set him up to be the rescuer of the Jews from the Egyptians. Okay? Exodus chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Now, a man of the house of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the banks of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Then, Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her slave girl to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying, and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister asked the Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered, and the girl went, and got the baby's mother. The Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this baby and nurse him for me, and I will pay you. So the woman took her own baby and nursed him. When the child grew older, she took him to the Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. It's a kind of amazing thing, isn't it? When you think about how God sets up Moses to be the person who's going to rescue the Israelites, the, the Jews, out of the land of Egypt. Think about Moses' family of origin, right? Something that Moses has no control of. Think about um, his birth family, 
What do you learn about them from this passage? What do you learn about them from the mother's daring, the sister's boldness, and the way that he was raised by the Pharaoh's daughter, right, after he grew up um, to be weaned, right? Um, you learn a lot about the Pharaoh, about his original family, even though they were supposed to turn in Moses and allow him to be killed. His mother hid him for three months. And then when she had an opportunity and realized, I can't hide him any longer, he's getting too big, she puts him in a basket, floats him down the Nile, trusting that God is going to rescue him and take care of him, right? Sending his daughter, her daughter, go, follow the basket. I know God is going to rescue this child. And you know something about her compassion to her, right? Because she refuses to let her child die. She will do anything to save this child of hers. And you learn something about the Pharaoh's daughter, right? Because her first response was, a Hebrew baby, my dad said to kill him, kill it right now. Instead, she's like, oh, he's crying. I know who this baby is, it must be one of the Hebrew babies. And so she picks him up, and then um, Moses' sister comes, do you want me to find somebody to nurse him? And she's like, oh yeah, I'll pay you to nurse, I'll pay somebody to nurse this baby. Raise him for me, and then I'm going to adopt him. What do you learn about Moses' family long before anything Moses has a chance to begin to describe for himself? You learn they're faithful, right, and bold, because that's certainly true about Moses' mom. You know that they're compassionate and caring and generous, right? And you know that from the Pharaoh, uh, Pharaoh's daughter. And I wonder how often we think about the ways that our family heritage as Asian Americans shapes who we are now and prepares us to be the kind of people that God desires us to be. What do you know about your parents? Most of us experience them as kind of, um, I'm going to guess because you're Cornell students, uh, people who are just a little tiger parenty, who have high expectations, um, who are often disciplined and dr uh, driving people, who love you but who often don't express it very much. And the way they express it is, I think you could do better. But if you think about your parents, right, and the actual characteristics that actually make up who we are as Asian Americans, part of what you know, right, is that um, <clears throat> our parents are highly disciplined people. Because you have to be highly disciplined in order to immigrate to a new country and start life over. Our parents are pretty courageous people, because I don't know about you, but I'm not sure I would have been, I'm willing to move to a country where I probably don't share the language, I probably will not have my family near me, and I have to start from ground zero in my career in order to build a better life for my children. Right? There are people who are willing to take risks. At least my parents did. My dad, when he immigrated to the United States, he already finished medical school. He came with um, $35 in his pocket. That's all the money he had. And he was going to be paid, I think, $50 a month when he started residency here in the United States. He knew nobody here except for my mom, who also immigrated. That tells a story when my mom was pregnant with me. Um, they were at Chinatown in Chicago, and my mom got hungry. And she said, you know, can we buy a Tasha Opa, one of those um, uh, barbecue pork buns that Chinese people make? And my dad, because they had so little money, even though he was a doctor back then, said, you know, could we wait till we get home? Right, let's just eat when we get home, we have food there. And my mom, as she's crossing the street in Chinatown, passed out because she was so hungry. And my dad told me that story one day, he was just weeping. He said, I never want you to feel so helpless and so poor as I felt those days. Right? I suspect a lot of your parents could tell similar stories of making incredible sacrifices relationally, emotionally, <coughs> socially, financially, in order to come here for you. It makes sense, right, that given a family that was faith-filled and compassionate, that Moses would be the kind of person who could help lead the people of Israel out of Egypt. You have to both trust God and have his heart broken by this uh, experiences that his people were having. How has God used your family's discipline, cross-cultural courage, and risk-taking to set you up to become agents of God here at Cornell and around the world? Think about Moses' ethnic journey, right? He's raised by Hebrews and then eventually sent into an Egyptian family. He's bicultural. Right? His earliest formative stages are set by his very Jewish parents, and yet he's raised by the Egyptian court. Um, who better to represent the Hebrews to the Egyptians than somebody who was raised in the palace of the Pharaoh himself? 
Who better to communicate to the people of Israel what their God was going to say than somebody who was um, raised by a Levitical family? Um, how has God designed your bicultural identity to allow you to be excellent missionaries and agents of change at Cornell and around the world? One of my colleagues, Chris Nichols, has said, I believe that Asian Americans should be our best evangelists and best agents of racial reconciliation because you have a unique socioeconomic um, and political location here in the United States, and you have an opportunity to speak in places that most people will never speak. How has God set up all of your identity, your family history, and things that you do not control to prepare you for the world? How is God using your education? Because if Moses was raised at the Pharaoh's court, right, he was raised with the other royal children. They got the best education possible in the ancient Near East. Kind of like you. Right, because if you graduate from Cornell, well, if you graduate with a college degree at all, you're already in the top 6.7% of the world, right, in terms of opportunity, education, and resources invested in you, right? The day you graduate from Cornell, um, you're easily at the top 6% of the world. Because you graduated from Cornell, right, which is in the top, what, 2 to 3% of the world's universities, 1%, depends on how insecure you're feeling right now. <laughs> um, even if you don't think you're in the 1%, you already are. <clears throat> There's more technology in your classroom than many villages have in the world. There'll be more spent on your education and more academic resources poured into you than entire nations will ever encounter. How does God intend to use that? How will you actually... Invest that and leverage that for something bigger than yourself. Part of how God designed this, right, our ethnic identity and our family heritage and the experiences that we've been entrusted are not merely for your benefit, but for the benefit of the world. And part of your task is to steward that. Part of your task is to steward your temperament and your um, failures. Look at verses, um, if you continue in Exodus, Look at verses 11 and 22, because Moses, for all that he has an amazing introduction, actually begins to fail miserably. One day, after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and watched them in hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating Hebrew, one of his own people. Glancing this way and that, and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. The next day he went out and saw he, two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? The man said, who made you a ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, what I did must have become known. When the Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses, but Moses fled from the Pharaoh and went to live in Midian, where he sat down by a well. Now, a priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came to draw water, <coughs> fill the troughs of water to water their father's flock. Some shepherds came along and drove them away, but Moses got up and <coughs> came to the rescue and watered their flock. When the girls returned to Ruel, their father, he asked them, why have you returned home so early today? They answered, an Egyptian rescued us from the shepherds. He even drew water for us and watered the flock. And where is he? He asked his daughters. Why did you leave him? <coughs> Invite him uh, to have something to eat. Three events, right, that we just read describe Moses as a young adult. And what do you learn about Moses in these situations? Well, one... Um, you learn that he killed an Egyptian who was oppressing the Hebrews, right? He, as an act of justice and vengeance, killed somebody he thought was um, treating the Hebrews wrong. <clears throat> he then tries to adjudicate between two Hebrews who are fighting, right? He sees people fighting and he wants to stop it. And then he defends the shepherds um, at the end of the section. Part of what you see with Moses, right, is he's an incredibly passionate person. Um, and this is both a strength and a weakness for Moses, right? Moses hates injustice, and you see that he sees a Hebrew beating, I mean, sorry, an Egyptian beating on a Hebrew, and he runs in and he kills the, the Egyptian because he hates injustice, and he's passionate. Um, and he, he, he sees people oppressing the shepherdesses, and he runs to their defense and begins to help them. Um, and when he sees people fighting, he wants to stop it. Um, but what you also notice about Moses is he's passionate, hates injustice, and he's a little trigger-happy. And a little quick, uh, quick to anger, right? He's a little impetuous in what he does. And what's worth noting, of course, is that these two things are related. Um, he hates injustice and is quick to act, and sometimes he's a little too quick to act and is a little hot-headed. 
And in fact, often our greatest strengths are actually the source of our greatest weakness. Right? Because we can over-rely on our strengths. Um, and there are dark sides to every strength. So if you're a good communicator, if you're um, good at singing, or good at speaking, or good at writing, what you know better than anyone else, right, is that you're also incredibly um, gifted at manipulating people. You know exactly how much to share, so it seems vulnerable and it costs you nothing because you didn't share anything important. And you probably do that when you're in Bible studies or small. I'm going to share something that seems really vulnerable and hurting, right? Um, for those of you um, who are super friendly extroverts, right, which is a great gift, we love those people who are like, so, yeah, this is great. Um, it's often easier to live your life outside with other people than actually explore what's going on in your own heart. Um, and knowing yourself deeply enough. For those of you who are introverts, right, it's easier just to set all, like, it's great that you reflect and that you think. Um, the challenge, of course, is that the riches and the gifts that you have are only expressed inside your head. And you never actually share them with other people. <clears throat> and you wait for other people to um, reach out to you, and when they don't, you judge them for it. <coughs> Even though it would never occur to you to actually pick up the phone and text someone. I mean, not call, that's really intrusive, but, right? <laughs> Um, for those of you with gifts of service who like helping people, <clears throat> it's a great thing. People need to be helped, especially here at Cornell. The dark side, of course, is that it's easy to feel like a martyr all the time. I'm the only one doing this. Nobody really cares. Right? It's always just me, and we become filled with self-pity. And again, we judge people for not being more like us. Um, all of our strengths come with a weakness, right? For, you're at Cornell. The reality is you have great intellectual gifts and you have great opportunity, and the reality is most people in the world assume and experience I believe people's incredibly arrogant and self-satisfied. There are reasons for that. In the Asian American community, our greatest strengths about community, right? I mentioned earlier, one, <clears throat> maybe one of our greatest strengths, often means that, frankly, we're cowards. When there's injustice, we don't speak out because we don't want to stick up. Um, when somebody actually says, no, that's wrong, we often don't want to do that. When we have to challenge one another to say, actually, what you're doing is destructive to yourself and other people, we usually use different models because we don't want to cause problems. The cross-cultural skills that we bring from our parents and the discipline, right, often mean that <clears throat> we just code switch from place to place and are unwilling to actually assert, this is who I am, this is what our community needs. How will we engage that? What I love about how God works in Moses' life is that Moses, God takes Moses' concern for injustice because it matches God's own hatred of injustice. And when Moses' passions align with God's passions, when Moses' process aligns with God's program, all of a sudden Moses can be used in ways that far transcend anything that we can expect. When Moses decides to take matters into his own hands, it always goes wrong. When Moses aligns himself with what God intends to do, People are rescued, history has changed, and our lives are different. It's also important to note God will continue to judge Moses for his impetuous anger. In fact, Moses will continually get in trouble for that through the rest of the book of Exodus. In fact, it's Moses' impetuous anger that finally moves God to say, You can lead people to the promised land, you're not coming in. What are your passions? What's your temperament? How could God take the strengths of who you are, the identity that he's giving you, and leverage that to be his hand and arm here at Cornell? And how do we need to become aware of the weaknesses and failures and dark sides of our gifts and temperament so that we can turn those over to God and allow ourselves to be transformed? And what I want to suggest to you is that the reason the small groups are critical and um, guppies <laughs> um, are so important is that the only way to actually leverage our strengths and to critique our witnesses is to have people who are outside of us and our own heads tell us what those are. Because we're very kind to our weaknesses and often unable to identify our strengths. And what you desperately need in your life, Cornell students, is somebody at this age and this time to tell you, when you do this, the world is a better
You need people to be able to say, you succeed in life and as a person created in God's image when you do this. And when you do this, you're respectively Satan's agent in our lives. Stop. And the reality is you will never be able to identify it on your own. What you desperately need is somebody who cares enough about you to tell you the truth. And that's why we sponsor programs like that. It's not to keep you busy. And it's not to create a false sense of um, vulnerability and community. It's actually because we are desperately in need of people who look us in the face and say, here's where you are beautiful and here's where you are desperately marred. And I will not give up on you. And I will accompany you until the worst, bent, broken parts of you are made whole. And the beautiful, wonderful parts of you shine. Ultimately, God takes right his ethnic identity, his temperament, which is in part shaped by his ethnicity and his experiences, um, and then he takes his life journey and begins to use it. Because you'll notice at the end, here it says, uh, Moses agreed to stay with the man who gave his daughter Zipporah to Moses in marriage, and Zipporah gave birth to a son, and Moses named him Gershom, saying, I've become an alien in the land. Um, and Moses essentially stays in the desert with them for 40 years. Right? That's the next 40 years of his life. Why is this critical? Because who better to lead the people of Israel through the desert than somebody who spent 40 years wandering around it already? <laughs> who better to lead the people of Israel through the desert um, than somebody who is a shepherd? Because, you know, sheep are notoriously stupid. They wander away all the time. Like, you really need someone to help them. And God goes, you know what? I'm going to give you, like, the people of Israel. Why don't you practice on sheep for 40 years? <laughs> Because, you know, you're going to spend 40 years in the desert by yourself, and you're going to spend another 40 years in that same desert, wandering with a far bigger flock. I'm going to use those experiences. Um, and then at the end it says, during that long period the king of Egypt died, the Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out, and they cried for help, so their slavery went up to God. God heard their groaning and remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. And at that moment, and we won't spend more time on Exodus, right, the pivot of history begins to turn. The people in Israel have been enslaved for, uh, for 400 years. God then works for 80 years to prepare this man named Moses, right? Gives him an ethnic identity um, that he can use to his advantage because who better to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt than somebody who was Israelite raised in Egypt before? He gives, he create, he raises up this man who has a passion to right injustices, <clears throat> who's compassionate at heart because his heart breaks when people are being abused. And he says, "You're the perfect person to lead my people out of Israel. I need you to be compassionate to the enslavement of the people of Israel, just like." I'm compassionate toward the Moses. I want you to have my heart, and I've made you impatient with injustice because I'm impatient with injustice. And so once your heart and my heart, once your passion and my passions align, we're ready to move. And then he says, not only that, I'm going to give you this experience. Forty years of the desert that to you seems like failure and a wasted life after being raised in the Egyptian court. And you're going to find for the next 40 years afterward that you are so thankful that you've trod over every dried out square inch of this desert because you're going to spend another 40 years doing it. You're going to be so grateful that you were able to herd a large flock of sheep because I'm going to give you a far larger flock of people to manage the desert. You're going to be grateful that you know where the oases are and where the dangerous places are. You're going to be grateful that you know how to survive in this kind of environment because I'm going to help you equip you and call you to help the entire community survive in this environment. <clears throat> what strikes me about Moses, and I'm going to end with this, is he's perfectly designed by God to accomplish God's purposes at that moment. Ethnicity, experience, temperament, family background, all of those work together. Part of what we're doing as we talk about identity here at um, Asian American University is that I'm convinced every aspect of your ethnic identity, your personal history and experiences are part of how God has shaped you so that you can participate in his purposes. 
There's some painful parts of our history, and there's some glorious parts of our history. There's some parts we understand, and some parts we haven't even discovered yet. All of those were built in that he intends to redeem, renew, transform, and then release through you to engage the world. <clears throat> I want to suggest that it starts here at Cornell. <coughs> there are, what, 50, 55 of you here in this room. There are 4,000 Asian Americans here at Cornell. You're better poised to reach them than almost anybody else here at the university. If each of you Right, we're to engage 10 people who are all Asian Americans. One tenth of all the Asian Americans at Cornell would be in a conversation with somebody who knew something about Jesus. That's all it would take. You all met um, <clears throat> hundreds of people um, during your student outreach. Uh, almost a quarter of all the Asian Americans at Cornell. What could you do to leverage that? God designed you for something bigger than yourself. I want to say, study hard. Leverage your talents and gifts. But don't assume that they're there just to get you into grad school. Or into a great internship. You were designed for something more. And if you aren't yet a follower of Jesus, then let me suggest, I'm convinced that you're here tonight because your family background and ethnicity and temperament has drawn you into this fellowship that you may not identify as a follower of Jesus, and you may be going, what am I doing here? And I want to suggest that you're not here by mistake at all. You're here for a reason and purpose. Something connected with you when you met the members of Asian American University. Something made you think, I'm willing to commit Friday night and, all, and half of the day Saturday to begin to explore this. I urge you, God's inviting you to join in his purposes, to participate in his plans to redeem and renew the world. I hope you'll continue that exploration, knowing that none of us are here by accident. We're all designed specifically for this, to be released as God's agents in the world. Let me pray for us. Today.